this day in Branchburg history, 1777. George Washington rides through Branchburg. Residents greet him at the town border, but do not believe it is really him. They tie him up and torture him in a shed, now a popular destination for school children, for 72 hours. After finally being freed by a drunken farmer, Washington places a curse on Branchburg, resulting in 20 years of bad luck and the town's population dropping by 90%. From Absolutely Productions, this is Branchburg with Brendan and Corey. Well, the results for eighth grade class president are in. The winner was that kid who promised to extend every student's life expectancy by 30 years. As you'd probably expect, he's completely panicking right now, just running up to kids in the hallway and handing them fistfuls of Tylenol. Someone should probably stop him, actually. I mean, I would, but you know, I'm just a math teacher. Oh well, I should get back to grading papers anyhow. Is this Derek? You have to pay me one dollar to unlock my answer to this question. God damn it! I've already spent about three hundred bucks this year on this type of thing. What am I supposed to do? I'll lose my job if I don't give the kids grades. All right, let's see what I have in my wallet. Oh, well, just a five. Well, I can go to the faculty room see if anyone has change. Hey, this is Corey. I'm not here right now. Just leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Hi, Corey. This is Steve from Branchburg Auto Body. I'm calling to give you the estimate on your car. After replacing your front and back brake pads as well as rotating your tires, it's going to be about $3,000. Uh, I know this is a pretty steep price, but, uh, well, we lost a lot of good men on this job. Yep, a lot of good men. One of them, he had a heart attack while rotating your tires, worked here 20 years. Uh, another one slipped on some oil. Your car was leaking when he ran out to attempt CPR on the first guy. Fell and hit his head, died on the spot. Damnedest thing. We had your car on the top rack. Uh, one of our guys was inside and forgot where he was. Went out to see what all the racket was and fell to his death. Of course, when he fell, he tried to grab the ceiling light, which broke off and swung onto another one of our men, which electrocuted him. Then another one slipped on the same oil from earlier when he ran out of the pro shop to give CPR to everyone, died. At some point during all this, one of our guys on the other side of your car slammed his hand in the door so hard the good lord decided it was his time too. Yep, a lot of good men. Our newest employee, Mark, he died in a car accident going to purchase your brake pads. He actually crashed into another one of our guys who died as well. He was coming back from lunch. So after them, it was down to just me and Todd. And to be efficient, Todd put all four of your tires around his waist, but then he tripped and rolled out into traffic, got hit by an 18-wheeler, died. So I'm the only one left. I guess you could argue that none of these deaths are really your fault, but then again, they all involve your car in one way or another, so. Look, I, I'm really doing you a favor here. I'm calling you before I even call their wives. I know you only dropped the car off here this morning, but yeah, it's going to be about 3000 Maybe I can get you to 2900 uh, Just give me a call back. Thanks. And if you look over here, this is actually the field where Washington's men camped out while they were in Branchburg. Hey, what are you guys doing over there? We beating up somebody? What? No, this is a, a Branchburg Revolutionary War walking tour. Revolutionary War? Ha! 
You know, the Revolutionary War was just an old wives' tale to get children to pay their taxes, right? What? Of course, it was first propagated by the U.S. Postal Service. Stamp-loving bastards. Naturally, I don't believe in government IDs. I keep a mold of my teeth in the attic if someone truly needs to identify me. Sir, do you need something? Yeah! Does anyone here know how to re-shingle a roof? My last guy just fell off! It was a pretty stressful morning at the YMCA. I had to open today at 4 a.m. One of the early bird members came in with a bag of kittens that he uh, wanted to drown in the pool. Yeah, pretty upsetting. Only other coworker was in the bathroom crying. The guy kept saying, I don't want to do it either. There's just too many of them. Well, of course I couldn't let him do that. I tried calling the pet shelter and they weren't open yet, so. Now I've got these 14 kittens running around my house. I, I thought it would be fun, but I think I, now I know what that guy meant. I, I, I mean, I'm definitely not like that guy, but, I, well, you know, this is a lot. <sighs> well, Ted, got what you wanted. Wanted to impress the new coworker. Look like a hero. And you learn she has a fiance. Rats. Maybe I can drown. Half of them? No, that would be it. Well, I can only go through so many couches! Uh, can't drown a cat because of your couch. Can you? Maybe it's different if it's leather, but... Hmm, I mean, mine isn't leather, though. So, uh... Actually, is it leather? It's a hybrid of some kind. It's just, it's a hybrid of what? What kind of material is this? The Branchburg Police proudly announces a new mascot. He's a little hot dog guy that one of the sergeants found in clip art. He's got a big smile and he's covered in ketchup and mustard, and he's now the face of the Branchburg Police. If any Branchburg residents have names for the little hot dog man, please call 911. Right now, the leading name is Officer Mascot. How's it going? It's Cory, just returning your call. Good to hear you fixed my car! Listen, it's kind of hard to hear most of your message. My grandson Dennis turned my kitchen into a place that practices Muay Thai. I know it's hard to believe I have a grandson since I'm 25, but I married an older lady and, well, package deal, I suppose. Parenting is a young man's game, Steve, and the younger you are as a grandfather, the better. Of course, Dennis is different from most children. He responds and snorts. I don't know. Anyways, how are you doing? Oh, that's right, this is a voicemail. Anyways, give me a call back when you can. Sorry your boy quit. Sounds like a toxic guy. I need to get Dennis out of the house, or maybe he'll stop by and apply. Would you do that for him? Thanks, Steve. Dennis! Hey, Dennis! I got you a job as a carpenter or something! On a cold Sunday in late February, hundreds of flyers were placed under the windshield wipers of every car in the shop right of Branchburg parking lot. People responded to these flyers the way people in Branchburg typically respond to flyers. By not reading them, by becoming furious that someone had the audacity to put something on their windshield, and by stuffing the flyers into the nearest sewer grate, contributing to the ticking time bomb that is Branchburg's sewage system. But had they taken the time to read the flyer, they would have realized that something remarkable was going to occur the following week. Because as the flyer said, Next Sunday and Monday, the Branchburg Historical Society will reenact the Battle of Branchburg on the same grounds where it was originally held 240 years ago. Inside the Branchburg ShopRite. The Branchburg Historical Society needed a win. They were a group prone to falling for spurious websites and dreams they had, and were still under fire for putting a plaque next to River Road Bridge that said Abraham Lincoln had once crawled across it. So for the 240th anniversary of Branchburg's own Revolutionary War battle, everything had to be exact. This included the very location itself, currently occupied by the world-famous ShopRite of Branchburg. 
Years ago, ShopRite had been able to build a supermarket on the historic battleground after convincing Branchburg residents that there is no greater honor than to buy your groceries at a place where freedom was fought for. Everything hinged on their participation. Thankfully, newly appointed store manager Carl Hepburn wanted to stand out from the other regional store managers. He believed that hosting a Revolutionary War reenactment inside his store would do just that. Since ShopRite could not afford to take two days off from selling goods, he made the decision to have the reenactment occur during normal shopping hours. Soon, it was next Sunday. Sunday is the largest grocery shopping day of the week, so naturally, ShopRite was packed. Beyond the thousands of normal customers making their way in and out of the store, there were 100 reenactors, 50 for each side. There were also 20 horses, 15 cannons, 75 muskets, 4 tents, 2 drummer boys, 7 George Washingtons, and 1 caged alligator. The alligator was there due to a mix-up, but since it couldn't be proven that there wasn't one nearby during the battle, the alligator stayed. Today, groceries and history finally collide, Hepburn said at the opening ceremony, standing on top of the deli counter and wearing a pirate costume, the closest thing he owned to a Revolutionary War outfit. ShopRite was a large part of the American Revolution, supplying both armies with food, and we are honored to host today's fake battle. When someone pointed out that ShopRite was founded six months ago, which was not true, but the point stood, seeing as ShopRite was founded in 1946, Hepburn pretended he had gotten stung by a bee and ran away. The opposing armies then took to opposite sides of the store. The British stood in the frozen food aisle, and the Continental Army stood in produce. All around them, customers continued to shop. Soon, a -a make-a-wish child from Branchburg Hospital blew the first horn. The battle began. The two armies charged at each other. Some shoppers who had not been paying close attention thought ShopRite was being invaded, so they grabbed their items without paying and fled. Every square inch of ShopRite contained a scene that any painter would kill to paint. Shopping carts were used as prisoner of war camps, and sample tables were raided at bayonet point. Horses strode up and down the aisles, crushing loose cereal and tortilla chips underneath their hooves. Children fed lunch meat to the alligator, and the eight-year-old drummer boy for the British set fire to a car in the parking lot. A decorative inflatable football character was slashed with a bayonet by a colonial reenactor, who then wore it as his skin for the remainder of the day. At some point, manager Carl Hepburn re-emerged, crawling away from the bakery with blood pouring out of his stomach. Of course, this had nothing to do with the battle. He had just tried to make cookies for the participants, and things had gone wrong. One soldier fired a cannon at the lobster tank to the cheers of nearby shoppers. None of the reenactors were using live ammo, but he had put a pomegranate in the cannon. It was an orchestra of supermarket destruction, and every item in the store was being used as an instrument. The only time it stopped was when a child threw a tantrum, and everyone paused to take a knee, similar to how athletes do when a fellow player tears their ACL. As mentioned before, there were seven separate reenactors pretending to be George Washington. This was intentional. Washington is the most important figure in any Revolutionary War era reenactment, so the Historical Society was taking no chances with illness or stage fright. All seven Washingtons showed up, and after spending three hours arguing over who got to be Washington, they eventually decided to team up and form a new army, the George Washingtons. They surrendered after 30 minutes and were locked inside the janitor's closet. Of course, at no point during the real Battle of Branchburg did seven George Washingtons get locked in a janitor's closet, but for the most part, the script of the real battle was followed to a T. The British took the early lead, then the colonies went ahead, then the British pretended to all be dead before launching a sneak attack, then the colonies also pretended to all be dead before launching a sneak attack of their own. But some liberties needed to be taken. The incongruities in technology were mostly ignored, except for one reenactor who stared in amazement at a checkout line conveyor belt the whole time. Then again, it was not entirely clear whether or not he was playing the part of someone from the 18th century, or someone from today who had just never seen a conveyor belt. The real battle of Branchburg lasted two days, so the soldiers were allowed to stay in the store overnight. Multiple campfires were set up throughout ShopRite. Smoke alarms blared, but no one paid them any mind, as the reenactors had taken to various ways of occupying themselves. Some played cards, some gnawed on loose grapes. A colonist got locked in the freezer while looking for food and got hypothermia. For accuracy's sake, his foot was amputated by the deli slicer. Manager Hepburn wandered around wearing period-appropriate pajamas and held a candle on a small plate. 
Papa when asked, he said this was something he did normally. A couple of the reenactors snuck out and went to the nearby Stone Mill Tavern, but when they came back, they were called deserters and hanged from the ceiling by their feet. At some point, the alligator escaped from its cage and made a nest in the sewer amongst the discarded flyers. The people of Branchburg later convinced themselves that this was environmentally friendly. Around 3 a.m., a burglar attempted to break into the store, and the two sides teamed up to stop him. They tied up the unarmed 16-year-old and threw him into the small pond at the front of the shop right. No, I work here! I'm a night shelter! It was a moment of unity amongst the chaos of war, the type of thing that makes one think a better world is still possible. Just how different would the Revolutionary War have been if the British and the Americans were fighting on the same side? Sunrise. Rays of newborn light ran through the store, and it made the tomatoes look gross. ShopRite reopened, and day two of the Battle of Branchburg began. The Make-A-Wish kid sounded the opening horn once more, then did a backflip, having recovered from his illness overnight. Then a reenactor turned the sprinklers on, ending the Battle of Branchburg the way it had ended 240 years ago, postponed due to rain. Historical reenactments allow spectators to view war without any of the actual horrors of war. It creates a perfect world, one in which there is still war, but during which no one dies, minus those who suffer unrelated heart attacks. It allows us to connect to our past, while still being able to live in a world where we can get into car accidents. The stated mission of the Branchburg Historical Society is to make history come to life. In looking out upon the almost entirely destroyed shop right of Branchburg, watching the reenactors sit quietly in their respective camps as shoppers maneuvered their carts around them, the sprinklers drenching all of them, one cannot help but think they achieved this. At the very least, it led to manager Carl Hepburn getting a raise. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to This is Branchburg with Brendan and Corey. They'll be glad you did.